Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Wake Up Missoula. I'm your host, Scott Ramp, ushering you into the last weekend in September. It is September 27th. The weather is looking pretty nice today, and it's only going to peak for tomorrow, and so you guys can enjoy some 80-degree temperatures, pretty much probably the last really good night leading into October. So October's coming up. It's going to be the spooky month. I'm sure I mean, a lot of you are getting all gung-ho on getting your uh, Halloween decorations up and ready to go for the October 31st. Um, also, one event that's happening right now is the Field of Screams. They basically started this weekend. They'll be going on every single weekend. They might even have like a weekend. I, I believe they even have some days after the 31st uh, just for some safety. Uh, but you guys can check that out. It's usually Thursdays through Sundays, just past, uh, uh, just uh, before Hamilton. And it's a great experience for people who like the haunted house or haunted experience. Um, I'm definitely a big advocate for those folks as well up in uh, the Bitterroot. Great way for people to get some spooks and some fuss like, like that. But also, I have some more news uh, for immediate release from the Missoula Asian Services. There are new scam alerts hitting old people in a full swing. And here are some tips to combat some of those um, key warning signs of scam calls. Unsolicited calls. Be wary of un un unexpected calls from unknown numbers, especially if the caller claims to be from a uh, reputable, reputable organization that you weren't expecting a call from. High pressure tactics, uh, scammers often create a sense of urgency, pressuring victims to act quickly or risk losing something valuable. And requests for personal information, legitimate organizations typically do not ask for sensitive information over the phone unless you call them and they need to confirm who they are speaking with. And you can protect yourself by simply just hanging up. You can verify by look up the official number of an organization and call them directly to confirm if the call was legit. For instance, if it sounds real, listen to what they have to say uh, 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 what information that they want and then say I'm going to call back using the phone number on my Medicare card what should I tell them to get connected to right department to handle this uh, and then report a call you can report a call at 1-800-551-3191 or you can go to the Federal Trade Commission at reportfraud.ftc.gov again that's reportfraud.ftc.gov again that number is 1-800-551 3191. All right, the city will finalize their deal with Black Knight, Black Knight Security Council Chambers in the hall, along with the fire department approving $7 million safer grant towards the funding of 20 new firefighters and a brand new extension of the budget around $9 million coming out of the 2025 fiscal year. The fire department is looking to fill some positions and the city is updating their contract with emergency response personnel, EMS. Uh, other than that, a couple places in Missouri are looking to rezone for development, not at the level of those larger developments in East Missoula and Hillview Way, but a couple lots of properties in the uh, Franklin to the Fort neighborhoods. And however, this is where it, we go into this meeting. Christian Jordan, through City Council, is worried about some of these rezonings as a Trojan horse for Trojan horse for uh, spot zoning. And this is what she had to say. Um, as we've seen time and time again in Ward 6, developers are seeking maximum density. They say they're contributing to housing affordability by saturating the market with market value homes. I did some research today and there is no evidence that towns like Missoula with high livability scores ever see a decrease in market values regardless of supply. These developments will not create affordable housing. They will only create rich developers. Further, by saturating poor neighborhoods where there are empty lots or by demolishing homes that are not worth keeping so developments are profitable, we're changing the character of these neighborhoods. Ward 6 is largely single-family homes or duplexes, not multiplexes, except for the recent developments that have gone for rezones to accommodate their market plan. Each time a rezone request is made in Ward 6, it is clear that safety is compromised because the sidewalks are not complete. It's almost impossible to walk more than two or three blocks in the entirety of Ward 6 without missing sidewalks, except 3rd Street and Eaton. Folks near this development will have to walk or ride their bikes in the street to get to the bus stops or to bike trails. <clears throat> I'm deeply opposed to this development because it creates a further safety risk in Ward 6, um, which struggles already with basic infrastructure. This development does not match the character of the neighborhood, and it is spot zoning, which may be legal but not ethical. 
All right, and so that was Christian Jordan talking a little bit more about that, about her response to this particular type of um, rezoning and more. Curtis Street is the spot zoning that Christian mentioned. It is essentially making an exception to zoning in some areas as the laws change to reflect infill gentrification, as many people want to avoid saying, uh, because the uh, growth, grow inward Missoula is part of the 2018 city policy that uh, was implemented about six years ago. And while Christian is holding her views up front, frankly, the Fort neighbors have been subject to major change over the last decade. However, many of these streets in the area are in poor condition and tend to take a while for infrastructure improvements. You know, I ride my bike through there and I find it quite enjoyable and have no worries from high traffic areas. Third Street uh, is my issue, but I have access to trails pretty easily in that area. So very much how they went from the rezoning from the 5,400 square foot per dwelling unit to 3,000 square feet per dwelling unit. While on the topic, Dana Carlino City Council spoke about another rezoning that would have larger multi-dwelling in the more traditional single level ranch style homes under these kinds of rezoning to allow higher density. And this is what he had to say about this. Um, you know, clearly we need more homes in Missoula, and you know, if we don't build um, in and up, we're going to be building out and urban sprawling and destroying more of our natural environment. Um, to speak to the parking mandates, it sounds like, um, you know, although we're going to allow more housing with votes like this, we're still blocking, like, the, you know, a lot of housing by forcing developers to turn a bunch of land into concrete, whether or not they'd like to. Um, so we're still blocking a lot of housing um, with our parking mandates and um, also that's just terrible for the environment as well, of course. Um, and then just to speak to the single family homes next to multifamily homes, um, you know, we saw through a code reform study that, you know, Missoula has been segregated by our zoning off of race and class and income. Um, and I think we should put an end to that uh, segregation through zoning. Um, and. Multifamily housing should be allowed just in the same place as a single family housing um, citywide to help protect our environment, um, to help um, end the segregation of zoning and to allow for more housing options. So I'm glad that we're um, approving things like this. All right. And so that was his response to the uh, infill uh, um, area. Um, let's see. And then we have, um, let's see, Christian Jordan, um, city council spoke again. Uh, oh, wait, wait, wait. Wait, where was this? Hold on one second. I got to make sure. Okay, so we're on another section of rezoning, and this is uh, Christian Jordan again reiterating her stance. Proposals like this don't fit the character of the neighborhood. They increase the um, safety risks for residents because there's no place to walk safely. Um, and it's just disappointing that we're, we are infilling maximum density in one of the lowest income neighborhoods in town, which, you know, speaks to kind of what Daniel was talking about. If we applied a DIY, a DI, sorry, a DEI lens, um, we would see more of these developments in other parts of town, but instead they're going into our poorest neighborhoods and um, it, it affects the quality of life for people in my ward. And it's frustrating as heck that we keep voting in these maximum developments in boards that are low socioeconomic, um, where people work really hard to get their way of life um, and can't have peaceable enjoyment of their property. And so I will definitely be voting no on this. It's just disappointing. All right. And this is what uh, uh, Gwen Jones had to say, because uh, Gwen Jones has basically been um, uh, about the process and she spoke very uh, um, um, you know, she basically beats the same dead horse again about the nece necessity for having this supply as the demand for uh, people moving to Missoula keeps growing, like um, growing insanely. And so this is Gwen Jones' response to all that. The neighborhood, I understand that it's changed. I understand that this is something different coming in, but we have a lot of neighborhoods in Missoula where there's um, different patterns of development across them and frankly i think it creates a more robust neighborhood um, and all of the one-story houses have the potential for a second story to be added on to them and i've seen that in many places uh, i would anticipate 10 20 30 years from now the neighborhood will look very different not just because of this development but be as people um, change those houses over time and create more density all right and so, yeah, I mean, things are changing and, you know, this is just another one of those, uh, just another chapter in um, those, uh, the realities of that things are just changing. The last thought on this topic always comes back to the idea of that private property owner allows for homeowners to do whatever they want on their property as long as it's up to code and the code changed.
uh, Christian dissent in voting while the rest of the council approved these rezonings. With that, we move on to our uh, committee meetings through the uh, MRA, uh, through budget and finance. Committees are looking to, uh, to have an elected board members instead of appointed one. The approval of the Missouri Development Agency expenditures will allow Missoula voters to elect the people who vote on how their tax money is spent. Daniel Carlino, um, is going to be um, uh, speaking against this particular topic, and this is what he had to say about that. Deserve the right to either vote on how they want their tax money spent or who's going to be spending their tax money. And currently, the Missoula Redevelopment Agency is spending taxpayer dollars um, in the tune of millions of dollars a year without an elected body approval or without approval from the voters. Some of the members of the Missoula Redevelopment Agency have been serving, spending millions of taxpayer dollars every year for longer than I've been alive. And Missoulians have not had a say on how that tax money is being spent because it's being spent by an unelected board um, that Missoulians cannot vote in and out. So that's what we're attempting to change today is to, after, after the MRA does their job, have an elected board approve the expenditures um, whenever there are $50,000 or more of taxpayer funds. And this isn't uh, beyond the realm of possibility because in many cases, uh, there are different kinds of boards and different kind of organizations that help raise money, help do all sorts of things, more boards for approval, and much like Fort Missoula and the library have various boards through their county extensions and citizen boards in the forms of friends of insert organization here. However, this new process is something that legacy council members kind of give a little bit of pause to, and Gwen Jones uh, talks about the process uh, about how necessary this organization is to remain as is. I have a lot of thoughts on this and a lot of questions, but I'm kind of going to boil it down to the basic issues, which when people come in to MRA with a project, so much work has been done ahead of time and investment made ahead of time. And then there's a lot of communication with MRA to see if this is going to work or not work. And <coughs> excuse me, and how is it ultimately going to uh, would it fit into their criteria and then it's vetted by the board. So if this is coming to city council, I mean, we have folks who weren't here this morning. We have folks who are online. We have votes where people online aren't present and their screen is black. I don't think we're the most predictable force out there when someone is supposed to be making a huge investment in something. So how would we have predictability when it's ultimately supposed to come to council and who knows who's going to show up that Monday night or be available to vote? Because frankly, I don't think we're that predictable at this point. Yep. So basically, democracy is broken. Uh, let's move on. Uh, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, the whole point of this is that it's just a lot more hoops have jumped through. And many times the city, city creates boards and, and interviews people to help run those boards. However, some of the criticism comes from TIF money, tax increment financing uh, that takes from the urban renewal monies for improving the area and uh, around development while offering tax incentives for additional contracting on the site for developers to basically be like, oh, you're building a building? Oh, wouldn't it be cool if you also um, um, build a sidewalk too, hey? I'm like, uh, why? It's like, here, here you know, tax incentives? Like, rather than us spending money later down the line, uh, later down the line, having to disrupt your process and your building facade inf improvements, why don't you, you know, also do this, we'll give you some tax incentives as a result. And then that's kind of how they do this. And there are different barriers, and different ways they can keep doing this and moving forward with that. But we're going to talk uh, about Ellen Buchanan, the uh, Missouri Development Agency director, who responds to some of this stuff and about the process in general. I think one thing that, you know, th this system was created in, in 78 or 79. It's almost 50 years old, and it's certainly been extremely successful. I think all you have to do is look around the urban core of, of the city of Missoula, and particularly the downtown area, and now we're seeing the same sort of emergence start to happen in Midtown. Um, it, you know, it's, it's, it's a system that is, frankly, the envy of a lot of the state and states surrounding us because we've been able to be as successful as we have in terms of turning areas that are underperforming around and, and uh, creating positive tax base in those areas. 
and creating amenities that make this the kind of community that we want it to be. Yep, and so that's basically what the city kind of evolved into over the years, just because a lot of people were not happy with the special improvement districts because it would isolate certain areas and certain neighborhoods, some poorer than others, to pay for their own sidewalks in full, rather than it being a part of a uh, multi-modal project, which enveloped a bunch of other things at the same time. So. And they don't, they, they, you know, the city has always had a hard time really selling people on uh, MRA. And it's not as shitty as most people in the community would actually love it to be. But Alan talks about the process going into helping programs and the city overall as final say on these projects for when they're for pr approval. The city knows about them. However, everyone agreed in the uh, meeting that the Rivara Street Affordable Housing Project was a net positive for the community, which used a lot of TIF funding and MRA. Uh, encouraged infrastructure improvements in nearby area on the north side. Um, Christian Jordan, uh, City Council, pushes back on MRA's budgeting process, and this is what she had to say. I would push back on Ms. Jones' question about the fact that the MRA is, is different because it's not. It, it's only different that it doesn't have the same oversight and process that the rest of our budget does have, which again includes multi-million dollar projects that take years and years to develop. So it, why is the MRA different is my question rather than why do we keep the MRA different when it doesn't mirror any of the other processes we have um, to date as far as projects and budget approvals go. Okay, and so that was one of the uh, prevailing questions is that many ways this kind of organization which has been around for like uh, Ellen said 50 years, the OMRA could just as easily be bogged down in uh, procedure by developers looking at to use the city to use them for additional development. I know that's a word salad, but time is the enemy of development and stop gaps cost tens of thousands of dollars for developers. Uh, the future of MRA is prioritizing the Midtown Master Plan that will affect Rose Park to Southgate Triangle neighborhoods as they look to improve and change their neighborhoods. The, uh, these are the monies that can be used for city planners to leverage development to have these so-called transformative funds that can be made in lieu of the vision of Missoula's long-range master plan. So the bulk of this meeting came down to what if, and Ellen answered most of the questions from, uh, from Clarity in the department, from the members in the process. And, um, you know, Ellen talks about the M MRA influence in city policy, and this is what she had to say. An application is vetted through a number of filters before it ever even, by the staff, before it ever even gets to the board. Uh, first and foremost, it's, it's vetted for legality of TIF expenditures. <laughs> Secondly, it's vetted for compliance with the city's strategic plan. It's vetted for compliance with the land use plan, or with the urban renewal plan. And if there is a master plan or some sort of an area plan for that particular location, it's vetted through that. So, I mean, we're one of the, you know, one of the primary things we're looking for is do these projects meet the city's stated goals that have been adopted by this body? Yep. And so, yeah, there's just a lot of things that are already in place and the things that are already being put into place. And uh, Sandra Versico, City Council, uh, references other boards the city has overhauled in recent years. Uh, talking a little bit more about the historic preservation. Um, I know that it's a really complex issue and the MRA um, does do a lot of good for the community. I would just would feel, um, I and a lot of my constituents would feel a lot more comfortable if there was that added level of, um, of, a, of a vote through um, the people that they elect. Um, there's, it, there is a precedent with this with um, the Historical Preservation Committee and uh, the Land Use Consolidated Planning Board. Um, they make recommendations whether to move forward or against or don't move forward with the project and then that comes to council for a final vote. So um, the, this isn't an odd thing to, an odd request to ask. Um, I, uh, I just really um, would, would like a, a thoughtful consideration with this. Um, I, I would really appreciate having this extra, like I said, the, this extra level of um, protection. And um, I, I guess I'm asking please. <laughs> All right, thanks. All right, so essentially um, it's just another level to be able to add for the voting. The resolution would essentially cap the $50,000, which if it went over $50,000, then the city would kick in for their final approval with some um, additional oversight from the city. These are boards and groups in Missoula that handle large amounts of money that are geared towards one department to allow to another with MRA not being an exception to the rule. However, the dissenting voices believe the MRA ain't broke. Why fix it? This will continue for consideration as they hold this for Monday night. 
as we are talking about committee meetings, most of the stuff is all informational stuff as they gear it up for Monday's meeting or they continue it in committee for the next following couple weeks. So climate conservation parks, they spoke about the energy inefficien inefficiencies in uh, modern buildings, which currently uses 50% of the budget for operations and energy. As this information was only, this is a presentation from McKinsky, Ms. Uh, McKinstry in Energy in the Future Development of Energy Efficient Buildings. So they're basically doing a sales pitch for the city of Missoula for climate conservation and parks. Uh, public safety and health, that's a big one because this is also affecting the Black Knight security contract with the city of Missoula. Black Knight kind of took over for Rogers International as the main go-to security company for the Johnson Street Shelter and the Pavarella Center and surrounding areas. Uh, and so their contract uh, from October 2022 and their contract is up by the end of September 2025. They handled the first contact for urban camping to high areas of concern for citizens to ease the need for a police presence for, by using de-escalation tactics. Uh, Mike Brady, Human Resources, a former police chief, spoke about this um, contract. The scope will include city parks and rights of ways and parking sites. And this rights of ways was added at the direction of um, city attorney and conversations that occurred about issues on the sidewalks and on the edges of shelters and parks that um, Black Knight has had difficulty um, engaging with those people, feeling like they, they weren't really expected to or could legally do it. Um, and, and their education and outreach includes those areas as well. All right, and so part of these areas is just to have a presence there in the, the corridors of these areas that are in and around. Um, in terms of numbers, Nikki Hill from Black Knight speaks about some of the statistics and some of the things that the uh, uh, Black Knight security have dealt with over the course of their um, time there. We had 183 reports uh, from the Pavarello Center. 72 of those were person to be removed. Um, the Johnson Center had 238 reports. 95 of those were person to be removed. Altogether, 421 reports, um, with 167 of those per person to be removed. Okay, and so those are some of the uh, numbers in which you know they've had to deal with people to a certain extent, where they actually have to have them removed in the first place. Low barrier shelters are a lot rougher since they uh, there is no prerequisite to enter, and every new year people are given a clean slate. Pavarella is a dry shelter and has certain requirements to actually get into the Johnson Street shelter. And as of late, just because the uh, the criteria, uh, not criteria, but the amount of demand of people needing to use their services, they basically have to do a lottery system. Uh, Johnson Street Shelter hopes to help up to eight people a month to get into some kind of uh, uh, permanent housing, rental or whatever, but so far they are only able to provide up to four to six people per month currently, and so they're trying to up that up, and that was their big pitch last week in which I talked about their money that goes towards services to the Johnson Street Shelter for not only for this year, but the next year to round up the two years of the three years that they have to have the uh, Johnson Street Shelter and Black Knight is just a part of it. So Daniel Carlino, City Council, doesn't like the expansion of this uh, of security in the region. And this is what he had to say. Mostly I'm against this because I think if we're going to have people patrol the streets with, with weapons and telling people what to do, it should be a public entity so we can have proper oversight. Um, I'm sharing my screen now just to show the map uh, before of uh, where the security was allowed to patrol. Um, they had a map here and um, and here around the shelters and just to point out the fact that this contract is now being expanded to the entire town um, when it used to just be around these shelters uh, but now it's to the entire public right-of-ways and parks which is a really big change um, frankly if we're gonna have people like enforcing the law and uh, telling people what to do and walking around with weapons um, we need to have uh, body cameras and oversight and um, frankly it just needs to be a public entity there's too many uh, moving parts and variables when we use a private company to to patrol the streets um, look at what happened with rogers international our last uh, security company they got caught red-handed by the news for wearing a bunch of um, hiding their identities and wearing masks as they do their job and tearing down uh, people who are homeless as uh, uh, campsites all right and that's uh, daniel carlino 
talking about uh, his experience uh, with the uh, group. And another argument was the use of guns from a security, but the law allows for personal protection. Even if the folks feel uncomfortable, the law in Montana does allow for open carry for all, not just security. However, the city does pay for private security, which could entitle them to not use guns. And Daniel Carlino had no intention of supporting this resolution and spoke frankly at the, uh, um, at the security company once again. Uh, and this is, this is my last quote for my city council, and this is what he had to say to kind of wrap things up. It's basically just mostly dealing with people that are, are homeless and, um, are, and, and it's really bizarre to have a private company doing this. It's um, coming from our parks funds that are meant to fund our parks. It's coming from our road funds that are meant to fund our roads. Um, this company has, you know, been found guilty of um, of hiring people that were working security that didn't have proper licensing from the state. Um, so we, as a city council, are about to decide to have a company who who is guilty of that um, walk around with guns and weapons, patrolling the streets of Missoula. Now the entire town, um, with no body cameras and no transparency, and frankly, it's just. Um, it's just really bad policy, and it's pretty new for Missoula. We have used security for a long time, but we haven't used security to walk around the streets and act like this for more than just a few years. So I hope it's not common practice in the future. Um, I think we'll see a lot of the same mistakes that, that, uh, that happened with Rogers happen with um, any other private company that we use. Uh, All right, and so that was Daniel Carlino. Uh, doing that last quote for you guys. And then kind of to uh, kind of reiterate and kind of speak, I mean, play devil's advocate because, you know, that's basically what I do most of the time. And the city moved this item to Monday's agenda for a front approval. When we think of the security, we think of the uh, misinterpret uh, who it, it's for and what the people of Missoula can see private security roaming the, uh, the trails and the parkway through this priority will be for the citizens who are homeless. And while I'm not 100% on board with this as a solution, this was a creation of necessity as complaints and issues arose through the shelters that don't exist with a post-security shelter world. We tend to overlook the crimes people using the shelter commit to each other and having constant contact to de-escalate can only go to control large amounts of people in the area from each other. This will uh, never stop 100%, but this will never uh, let uh, prevent the worst outcome from low barrier shelters where intoxic intoxicated individuals do not cause a scene for lack of a better word. And you know, it's, it's, it's an interesting kind of thing and this has been kind of like a big back and forth, but the security was put into place because it was a necessity and the city had to put money for this. And now that the, um, one of the, re the arguments against having the security cameras or any kind of additional stuff with that is the additional money that we would be required for this. And the city wasn't about to, uh, give out any more money on this and Daniel Carlino was very uh, adamant about how like a, a lot of parks and roads money and general fund money would be going towards this private security but the whole point of this is for the city council to give citizens of Missoula peace of mind and at the same time have people in the shelter have a little bit more peace of mind to know that their stuff is secured and safe even though that um, there there's always an incident in which you know you you have to deal with the fact that the security individuals are people as well. And yeah, I mean, it's, it's an interesting argument that they're gonna carry on throughout the next Monday's meeting, and I'll talk a little bit more about it next week. Um, but for right now, we're gonna move on from city council. A good chunk of the show was already been devoted to this, so we're up next, we're gonna talk about, we're gonna show you some promos, and then I'm gonna talk about some movies that are coming out next weekend. Gosh, it's so hot out here in this summer, I'm burning alive. <laughs> Wizard. Yeah, yeah. Oh. Saw wet because it sounds like sharpening a saw. Saw wet. W H E T. That was a common sound when they named them because they were sawing down the forest in the east. It's not really a good name now, is it? Saw wet. But anyway, he got hit by a car up in Kalispell. So little Billy, when I put him in his building, I said, little Billy, supper's ready. Little Billy, supper's ready. And it turns out the person that found this bird and rehabbed it is named Billy. Weird, huh? So anyway, it's a good name. 
Um, Owen we had for I think 11 or 12 years. Um, he was an adult. We got him from another center. But it's always fun to take a small owl. Now is this a baby? No. Does it get bigger? No. So right now he's panting. Um, he's cooling off. They call that a ghouler flutter that owls do. And uh, the female would be a little bit bigger. Um, they nest in cavities and holes in trees. They're nocturnal. They eat rodents and insects and probably catch some birds. He gets three little mice a day. Little, little mice. And there he's winking. Little Billy. Little Billy is a northern saw-wet owl, a species of owl that lives in most of the U.S. and some other regions of North America. They are some of the smallest owls in North America, with an average weight of only 3.6 ounces. Fighting the evil Skelly Men. You never steal our Bubble Hill, Skelly Men. <laughs> I will take over the Bubble Hills. Go, Go Robots! NCAT Animation Drop In Workshops every Saturday from 1 to 3 p.m., located in the Missoula Public Library, 455 East Main Street. I'll get you next time, Robots! Next time! Go Robots! Hey guys, welcome back. Let's talk about some movies that are coming out this weekend. It's time for Pre-Critic. Why pre-judge a movie based on absolutely nothing but my pre-biases towards movies in general? Let's kick things off with a little movie we like to call um, Francis Ford Coppola's Megalopolis. Megalopolis is basically just a movie that uh, had Francis Ford Coppola spending his own money to make his own vision of reality. Maybe a little bit of studio interference can go a long way, but okay, but boy do we have one of those long films about how an architect can change the world and apparently has like time powers or whatever, but sure he's a famous and uses his stature as the premier architect to make the most architecture that architectures would be like Cool building, bro. Then get stuck in those buildings as society crumbles. But hey, pretty buildings, right? They also can change the world. Buildings, that's where, where are and uh, is a way for people to show off. And, you know, the taller the better, right? Um, then we have The Wild Robot. Uh, we have yet another Pixar type film. It's uh, DreamWorks, a studio that braces for another cutting 14% of their jobs while Bob Iger pockets a cool billion. Um, as he just kind of cuts jobs and maximizes profit with artists, make the uh, make the bulk of the movie, which basically, this movie is basically Wally. -E, but if the world actually had nature and it was produced by DreamWorks, watch as the robot learns from nature and unites the wild things against the growing technology that is destroying their habitats. I smell a little bit of Oscar bait in this animation category, even though Inside Out 2 is probably going to win. Um, as we dive into the beginning of a terrible horror films and dramas films that get Oscar selection community salivating. Uh, animated movies around ducks seem to be the norm this year because they had, uh, yeah, because basically the robot raises a duck uh, as their own, then they learn to speak the animal language, and then there's animals talking. So uh, I don't know what to expect, but you, you, you probably can expect a lot from that. So up next, um, we have a horror film. Um, it's called Bagman. Oh, the Bagman childhood drama starts with a film about a guy who moves back to his hometown and discovers the bag that was under his bed was more than just a bag. But it has history and trauma with people who use these bags to kidnap ki kids and frankly seems like it was a prank by his parents taken a little too far and he uh, retreated into himself and deals with the trauma of bag stuff. Anyways, the movie's a horror film, so it's obviously going to be real. So his son is taken away. Only he can use his untake ability that he knows about being a big, 
victim uh, to his son from the bag man and learn how to be the man he was always meant to be. Uh, a bag man fighting person. All right, we got a lot of movies coming out and we're going to speed right through them. Vindicating Trump just in time for the election. Why not watch a conservative documentary talking about how awesome Trump is? Can't wait for the coconut tree documentary with uh, what's her face? Uh, Kamal Harris. Putin, just when it was time for Russia to turn things around on the national stage comes Putin where he goes on a quest to find his shirt after being bucked from his horse. Why do you, why did they heavily Photoshop these men to like make them look like they're 20 years younger? Then we got uh, notice to quit. Sometimes when life hands you lemons, you get a 10 year old daughter. Welcome to Big Daddy without the charm and plenty of poverty when a man down in his luck gets a kid there, forcing him to be the man he was always meant to be. I'm gonna be, <laughs> be the man he was always for, meant to be over and over again. Empire Waste, you have a big body. This movie teaches you an embrace that looks, uh, that look um, as fat jokes fly and the costume brings the haters back down and want to be fat to get those dresses because that's exactly how it works. Um, oops, where is that? Oops, anyways, th this movie's called uh, She Taught Me Love. When, you, uh, when you've... Uh, a reclusive artist and your art attracts a girl because you don't have the will to talk to them and she has to do all the work the movie and then finally we have escape from extinction aka rewilding a documentary about deforest de deforestation and the dwindling population of animals in the backdrop of global warming anyways this documentary talks about a conservation group reintroducing populations to native plants in these experimental forests and jungles um, to save the, you know, to, you know, plant the trees, to save the whales, and save no snails. The only joke I saw for this one on climate. All right, so up next we have a uh, new dub and stuff where I redub an old movie from way back when. And th this target is the 1945 movie, The Lady Confesses. And, without, and when I come back, we're going to talk about some things that are happening in Missoula. Hmm, I don't know. Well, so what do you think about desserts? Hmm. I don't think so. I don't know about you, but they got a creme brulee that's out of this world. And I want that fire on that cake. Well, maybe I can put a blowtorch to some jello when we get home. <laughs> Did someone say jello? <laughs> How you doing over here, guys? Oh, uh, would you like to join us for dessert? <laughs> no, thank you. Oh, hi, Stephen. How is the infidelity? Highly encouraged. <laughs> uh, would you like some creme brulee? I'm thinking about ordering it. Uh, no, no, thank you. I'm trying to, you know, watch my weight. <laughs> you know how that is. You know, you're trying to lose some weight. Just eat less. That makes more sense, right? Well, I suppose that works, but we just thinking about getting some dessert right now. Well, it doesn't seem appropriate to have dessert after lunch, don't you think? Ugh, you know, I'm getting really sick and tired of people telling me that I can't have dessert when I'm just trying to be nice and share dessert with other people. But as it turns out that I can't just have dessert. Eh? I don't understand. Can I get dessert without fanfare? Well, I suppose you can get dessert without any kind of fanfare. Just order it already. You're just going to argue with yourself and bring your wife into I this? I just can't order dessert without sharing it, okay? Because once the dessert gets here, she wants a bite, and if she doesn't like it, okay, she wants to send it Okay, I guess. Back. I mean, you could if you wanted to. My wife has what we call a, a, a tricky palate of sorts. She likes to get dessert, but she doesn't like to admit that she likes to get desserts. It's very uncomfortable because when I get desserts, she's usually like, no, send it back. I don't like this. And I'm like, what do you want from me? I'm trying to get desserts here and you're not happy. When are you ever going to be happy? I'm just, I, let me ask you. Well, looks like uh, my time is up. I have to get going. Huh, that's funny. You sat down and you made yourself comfortable. Well, things change and uh, I bid you guys adieu. I hope you guys have a wonderful, uh, dessert. May I recommend the, uh, chocolate mousse cake? It is quite delicious. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Avoiding the situation. Huh. Well, the chocolate cake seems nice. Why don't we get that? I want the creme brulee. Well, maybe next time we can get the creme brulee. And, well, right now we can get, like, the chocolate cake. Would that be okay? You didn't even want dessert a second ago. Why the heck do you want chocolate cake over creme brulee? It's what I wanted. Can't I have what I want? I'm sorry I'm avoiding eye contact with you. Well, how about you order the creme brulee? Oh, yeah? And I'll get the chocolate cake. We'll both have what we want. Yeah. But I don't think I'm going to be able to finish it, so we might take it to go in a go box, if that's okay. Do you honestly think that I want a to-go box? 
I don't want to take it home. I want to finish everything we need to finish here. We're not going home after this, remember? Well, do we this, have remember? to go to the Johnsons? Their dog is such a bitch. Oh, with the swearing. <laughs> Hey guys, welcome back. Um, yeah, you know, um, what's, the, what's the point of uh, having dessert? I mean, heck, we have pancakes in the morning, so why can't we have dessert after lunch? Anyways, let's jump right into some events that are happening in and around the city of Missoula. If you are interested in doing a rummage sale, St. Paul Lutheran Church at 202 Brook Street in Missoula is doing a rummage sale this morning and tomorrow morning, starting right now. So if you wanna go, just go check that out. It's a rummage sale from 8 a.m. to 3 p.m. both days um, until noon. You can fill your grocery bag for $4 or fill two bags for $7. And this is all just rummage sale type stuff. Adult Quiet Hour at the Butterfly House. This is a new initiative by the Missoula Butterfly House and Insectarium. Uh, it looks like it's a brand new thing for the first hour starting at 9 a.m. You guys get go to the butterfly house without worrying about a bunch of kids going around it's kind of like adult swim essentially but for the insects cool and then their regular hours open at uh, 10 a.m for most people um family fun time if you're interested in doing some family fun time indoor fun everything kind of thing even though this would probably be the last night's nice weekend uh, mismo roots acro sports center get air trampoline park and the ymca are Perfect introductions for people who want to stay fit and stay indoors. Great way to get out and about besides, you know, gyms, of course. Um, Missoula Food Bank meal distribution starting at 10 a.m. This is a great way for people to, uh, from all different walks of life to get a nutritious food uh, through the Missoula Food Bank. So it's Cozy Fall Lifelong Learning Center. They're doing many of these classes and this one is a sew, sewing class. Um, if you ever tried your hand at making clothes but not sure where to begin, this class is perfect for you. They provide pattern that you'll learn how to create a three quarter length or short sleeve shirt and become a key part of your wardrobe. You can either bring your own fabric or use material provided that does cost money to take most of these classes and this particular one is 103 dollars but why not learn that to learn to make clothes tiny tales is a story time here uh, at the missoula public library every friday at 10 30 a.m they do story time at 10 30 on saturdays fridays is devoted to tiny tales which is both uh, a reading and activity based curriculum for young kids um, great opportunity for that as well it's an uh, it's weekly it's a drop in second floor of missoula public library lunch at the missoula senior center uh, it's 11 30 a.m this is a great place at the missoula senior center to uh, provide nutritious meals for adults uh, at about eight dollars a plate and then of course Pavarella center does have their own uh, lunch breakfast and dinner uh, every single day for people who are struggling to get food security, um, even if they're not allowed to be in the uh, Pavarella, even though they don't have, they can't stay inside the Pavarella Center, doesn't mean they can't eat at the Pavarella Center. Uh, yarns at Missoula Public Library. This is a great way for stitching, crocheting on the fourth floor of the Blackfoot Board Meeting Room. Watercolor painting class in the Cooper Room at 12 noon every single Friday at 12 noon. All Abilities Art Club. This is a great way for people, uh, ADA accessibility, to uh, learn art and be in a group of uh, people who are also like you, um, uh, disabled and looking to uh, get involved with art starting at 1 p.m. every Friday at base. Young Adults, Adults Writers Group. This is a opportunity for uh, writers to uh, get crit criticism and uh, crit crit constructive criticism. Sorry, that was an alliteration I, in my study was showing. Uh, at 3.30 p.m. every Friday at the Missoula Public Library on the second floor. D&D Guide for Adults, uh, virtual at the Missoula Public, Public Library. You can go to uh, the website or go to MissoulaEvents.net to find the link. Uh, Natalia Boise is going to be playing some folk music at Nation Nation Brewing Company tonight at 6 p.m. Free Cycles concert in featuring Wailing Aaron Jennings. Uh, Bluegrass at Free Cycles tonight at 6 p.m. Band Books, this uh, band book, uh, band books week uh, is the teen reading at Missoula Public Library. Celebrate their freedom to read at your library. Youth grade seven to twelfth grade are invited to hang out on the second floor of the library after hours to read your favorite band or challenged book starting at six thirty p.m. But don't try to kill John Lennon after reading Catcher in the Rye. Uh, but anyways, Sundog North at Old Post Music. I'm sorry, that joke is really tasteless. But regardless, um, the 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 movement at the Wilma Theater, rock and reggae. Is going to be at 7 p.m. West Fest. This is all going all weekend with matinees at the Westside Theater, doing performances from various artists. Um, uh, Westside Theater dance performances, and then we have karaoke at the Jackson at 7 p.m. Uh, Blue Shadows at Cranky Sam Public House. 
um, playing blues music at 7 p.m. tonight. Melissa Bangs presents the Bangersons, Banger, Banging, Banging Sons, a uh, love ballad. At, it's going to play performing theater at the Zootown Arts Community Center at tonight at 7.30 p.m. It's going to go on through the weekends. Missoula Homegrown Comedy Competition Round 3 at the Roxy starting at 8 p.m. Mudside Charlie is going to wrap up your uh, Friday night at Union Club at 9 p.m. And then as we go into Saturday, this is uh, going into our last uh, hurrah in the Saturday markets in the downtown Missoula area as the weather's starting to get a little bit cooler, but the, tonight might, tomorrow might be the last really nice day to enjoy the farmer's market as the weather gets colder and colder every single day uh, going into October. St. Paul Lutheran Church, like I said, they're doing the famous bag sale at uh, on day two. This is their roundup um, for their bag sale from 8 a.m. to 12 noon. Zootown Challenge Obstacle Course Race. University of Montana is hosting a run, push, pull, slam, and climb over obstacles in legendary Washington Grizzly Stadium. It's a 5K and 10K options, and they're doing the breathtaking climb of the M Trail, so you can't go to a university obstacle course race and not climb the M. Starting at 9 a.m. on Saturday, Crafty Pants Craft Fair at American Legion Hall at 9 a.m. This is, I believe, on Ronan Street. Um, Norman McLean, um, um, literary Festival is at 9.30 a.m. at the Wilma on Saturday. Uh, a two and a half day f uh, festival fe featuring art, uh, author presentations, field trips, and reception at the Danny Gallery from the Friday evening, September 27th, to Saturday to September 20th at the Wilma and Sunday, September 29th in the field. Uh, Climate and Clean Expo at Karis Park. If you're interested in getting solar panels or looking for a green energy initiative for your own life, uh, at 10 a.m. Karis Park, they're ho hosting a bunch of booths where you can gather information about that. Uh, Starlight Pumpkin Kids class. This is painted with a twist. They do these classes. They do a bunch of these things for people who want to do that. Women-led carpentry workshop, Missoula Urban Demonstration project at 10 a.m. on Saturday. Mud is a woman-led introduction into carpentry. Um, story time at 10.30. I already talked about this. I'm Mr. Public Library every Saturday at 10.30 a.m. Moon Randolph Homestead open hours, 11 a.m. Learn about homesteading in Missoula and Missoula preserves this site for future uh, uh, look back on uh, homesteading in Montana. Uh, museum tour at the Missoula Art Museum at 11 a.m. every Saturday at 11. Trekker Kids at uh, Art in the Park, Travers Rest State Park in Lolo. Take a short hike through the Travers Rest State Park and paint. Um, MCAT Saturday drop-ins, uh, you probably saw the promo a bunch of times and I'll talk about it again. MCAT does our Saturday drop-ins from 1 to 3 p.m. here at the Public Library here in this very room, uh, sans green screen behind me. Uh, Raptors and Art with Bev Glukert and Kate Davis is going to be at the Traveler's Rest State Park in Lolo at 1 p.m. on Saturday. Missoula Violin Lessons at Missoula Public Library on the fourth floor from 1 to 2 p.m. If you are interested in learning how to fiddle, this is the best time to do it. And they have a bunch of um, instructors go up there, bring some fiddles of their own, and you get a chance to kind of mess around and figure out if you, this is for you. Western Cider Harvest Party. Tis the season for apple pressing and apple cider, and Western Cider is the one of the first ones to do their harvest party. From 2 to 6 p.m., they do Frito Pies. 2 to 4, they're doing Wolf and the Moon's music. Uh, crank Apple Press Competition from 4 to 6 p.m. Missoula Public Library Bookmobile Launch Party is at 5.30 p.m. on Saturday. So they just got the new van just out front. They want to celebrate the new bookmobile. They're thrilled to invite the community to the special events where Library Director Slavin Lee uh, will be sharing insights about the bookmobile role and bringing library service to every corner of our community. Blue Shadows is going to be performing Blues at Imagination Brewing Company at 6 p.m. on Saturday. Coulter Wall is going to be playing at Kettle's Amphitheater night one. Um, Austin Britton at DraftWorks uh, playing music there at 7 p.m. Blue Collar Band at the Jack Saloon at playing some country music Saturday night at 7 p.m. Missoula Symphony Orchestra later 7.30 p.m. at Denson Theater. Uh, Gershwin Celebration. The Black Ram Guitar Festival is at the Wilma at 7.30 p.m. Shake Well is going to be at Cranky Sand Public House playing some funk music. Um, solid, ca solid Sound Karaoke in the uh, uh, Bold Dog Lounge playing um, Westside Lanes at 9 p.m. Ida Ranch Hands is going to be at Union Club. Um, International Latin Music Dance Night at Eagles Lodge Salsa Music. DJ Chris Moon every Saturday at 10 p.m. West Fest where they're going to be continuing at the uh, West Side Theater uh, with their performance at 10 p.m. to wrap things up for your Saturday. And then finally Sunday, you got Missoula Buddy Walk. Join the Montana Down, Down Syndrome Association to unite for a common cause in the 2024 Buddy Walk fundraiser starting at 1230 at Karis Park.
uh, Garden City Salsa, Nashmore Salsa this weekend, Rocky Mountain Ballet Theater at 1 p.m. in the afternoon on Sunday. And then a Gershwin celebration continues, so if you missed the Saturday night performance for the Missoula Symphony Orchestra, they're doing it at 3 p.m. at the Denison Theater on Sunday. Pinball tournament, odd, odd pitch at 4 p.m. on Sunday. Every Sunday is a weekly event. Uh, Blue Shadow at DraftWorks, playing some blues music at DraftWorks at 5 p.m. on Sunday. Please pay attention. Uh, Burn Street Community Center is doing a poetry open mic uh, at 6 p.m. Uh, Eric John, uh, 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 <coughs> sorry. So er uh, Eric uh, Koskikinen, Jeffrey uh, Falklot uh, is going to be live at Monk's playing some folk and country music. Uh, very funny comedy open mic at VFW at 8 p.m. Sunday night, and then karaoke at the Sunrise Saloon to wrap up that as well. And so those are your events this weekend. And I do have a little bit of time, and I'm not really rushed to uh, put this out as we're talking a little bit more about this. So in a footnote, in an article highlighting the return of astronauts to Russia confirms that the two astronauts stranded by Boeing shuttle will return with SpaceX next year. So recent reports of two Russians return after one of the longest stints in the International Space Station, Olog um, and Nikolai Chub, Club, Chub, return after 374 days, more than a year, aboard uh, the International Space Station. And on Friday, they broke the record for the longest continuation in space. Um, also in the capsule was American uh, Tracy Dyson, who was in space station for six months. According to AP News, eight astronauts remain in the station, including Americans Butch Wilmer and Suni Williams, who have been remained long past their scheduled return to Earth because of the uh, Boeing new Starliner capsule. Had some interesting leaks, but their, their trip was marred by thruster troubles and helium leaks, and the U.S. Space Agency, NASA, decided it was too risky to return on the Starliner. The capsule returned without them, unmanned, recently with no problems. Um, and then as we go back to Earth, talk about some Earth news, Israel has apparently lost the bombardment of Lebanon this week after months of tensions that reached ahead when beepers and walkie-talkies exploded last week. This week, through the bombardment of Lebanese, Health Ministry reported um, 490 initial deaths Monday, and many Israeli officials claim Hezbollah has been hiding munitions in small towns towards south, using people as human shields. Um, this, thus far, the Lebanese Health, Health Ministry confirms uh, 569 people, including 50 children and 94 women across Lebanon since September 23rd. Uh, Hezbollah has targeted Israel's largest city, Tel Aviv, in strikes Wednesday, but the Iron Dome protected the city. And they've been launching rockets since the Gaza War began, with 60,000 Israelis uh, displaced for 11 months from the northern border. However, since the military actions on Hezbollah, 90,000 people have fled the southern regions of Lebanon um, as a result. October 7th is on the horizon, marking the year-long war with a terrorist organization that have embedded themselves in densely populated areas in both Gaza and Lebanon. As the war in the Middle East continues to, uh, to a new chapter, Ukraine's invasion of Russia, of uh, the Russian homeland, has prompted uh, updated peace talks with President Vladimir Zelensky, saying is a shared victory for a truly just peace. Two and a half years since the war started, Russia has taken a good chunk of the U Ukrainian territory, and with the counteroffensive failures, U.S. money backing Ukraine seems skeptical. However, the momentum turned the war as the Ukrainian forces entered and took over a couple regions in the Russian territory. Uh, Zelensky has expected to present his peace proposal, which has been dubbed a victory plan to Biden this week. Um, do, do, do. Oh, yeah. And then, of course, this is something I wanted to talk about last Friday, but it, I ran out of time. Um, Donald Trump had another uh, attempt on his life. Um, uh, by an assassin, uh, by, an assassin uh, by an assassin while golfing in Florida. And of course, skipping over the details because this has basically been going on for the last um, half a month, if not a little bit more, and written notes on whether f the former President Trump would be uh, um, throughout his camp. Oh, wait, wait, hold on. Uh, so basically, the mystery uh, of this had to do with Ryan Wesley Ru uh, Routh, who uh, was app apprehended soon after S uh, Secret Service began shooting at him from the bushes that he stayed 12 hours to surprise the president at the t the former president at the time. Uh, the mystery, and of course, uh, Routh mess left a mystery box left unopened that had everything from plans, dates, and munitions to his attempts to stalk and pursue the candidate. The note describing Routh's plan was placed in a box that he dropped off months earlier at his home to an, an, an unidentified person who did not open it until after Sunday's events. Uh, the, the note describes Routh's plans was placed in a box that he dropped off months earlier, earlier in a home. Um, 
And so far, the case being built uh, currently sits at 20 years in prison, but the DOJ say they look to throw everything at the individual during this investigation. It's been a very weird kind of thing because as they looked into this person's past, he's b done a lot of bad business practices and everything like that, even to a point where he offered $150,000 for the assassination of Donald Trump, even though he, ha he himself has been uh, shown to not have paid any of his debts or anything in, in that regard, be able to pay for that kind of thing. So he's kind of like been living off the grid, off the grid, and kind of using the grid to a certain degree to kind of sustain whatever lifestyle he's trying to do, which was very pro-Ukraine, which is why I kind of brought him up. Anyways, back to Montana, the university has seen an, an uptick in student enrollment since the fall that hasn't been this big in 15 years. As someone who went to college 15 years ago, one of the major issues was access to student housing as Missoula students dealt with the shortages of student housing going into the early 2010s. However, many of these things changed when reports of rape severely affected the university from 2011, which led to the Department of Justice narrowing their focus on campus living and affecting the female enrollments uh, uh, severely. And as time went on, the university had to contend with the, uh, uh, the author and famous writer, John Krakauer, who wrote the book on the football team through court reports and affidavits, news or stories highlighting the culture of, a, uh, of abuse by student athletes. Um, it's funny that Krakauer, who wrote A River Runs Through It, which made Missoula and Montana a destination for fly fishers and just a place to be, wrote a nonfiction account of the uh, troubles Missoula saw over the course of nearly a decade, to which the university has made a lot of sacrifices by freezing their enrollment fees and waiting, f uh, waiting out their reputation to get a little bit better. Of course, I, I hate to beat a dead horse, but that is definitely a big part of University of Montana's history and the fact that the university has made strides in making campus safer for students and faculty alike. Well, bolstering their campus security to be a point of having their own police presence on campus. So you've probably seen some, a couple of their cruisers with a university symbol on them. UM officials report that full enrollment on the main campus is up nearly 6% and including Missoula College total enrollment is up 5%. 484 more students enrolled at the university this fall than 2023, bringing the total enrollment to 10,811 students currently at the campus with 1,450 first-year freshmen enrolled at the University of Montana. In addition to undergraduate students, UM graduate school, school grew no, nearly 1% to 1,847 students and the uh, Alexander Blewett III, the third school of law, grew 3.1% to 269 students this fall. Uh, as the UM has good news for students, so does MSU for their enrollment over over 17,000 students this year. The university welcomed 3,611 new first-time college students this fall at the MSU campus. MSU's, MSU's fall head count was 17,144, an increase of 1% over the last fall's total, which itself is a record uh, at 16,978. Montana State is the largest university in the four state regions, include Wyoming and the Dakotas. Um, as the largest university in Montana, MSU continues to play a vital role in meeting the state's workforce needs. According to MSU, uh, they saw record enrollment at Gallatin County MSU, the university's two-year program, which prepares students for immediate um, employment in, in the demand fields. Gallatin County MSU enrolled 1,101 students, with it, which is an increase of 22%. UM leads the states in arts and science, while MSU tends to be math, art, architect, uh, agriculture, and engineer focused. Both schools uh, hold a healthy rivalry when it extends to national attention, especially when it involves football. And for the sake of string of consciousness, the Grizz Cat game is scheduled for Saturday, November 23rd. Uh, this is, harkens back to the NCAA, which also looks to get the rights to players, their likeness, and more in a major deal that our governor, uh, uh, G Greg Gianforte, said it would be bad business for the state of Montana. So in the Daily Montana, uh, the Daily Montanan reported that in the lawsuit against the NCAA, uh, the student athletes had argued that NCAA was unjustly profiting from their NILs, and they uh, challenged the rule that prohibited them from receiving anything of value in exchange for their commercial use. Earlier this month, South Dakota Board of Regents filed a lawsuit alleging that the settlement unfairly favors huge universities and disfavors female competitors, according to the South Dakota Searchlights. The settlement would cost Montana State University and the University of Montana together estimated $4.4 million over the next 10 years. Uh, UM Athletic D Director Ken Haslam said the initial projection for Missoula is a loss at 200000 a year for the decade. Um, uh, let's see. In the, in the letter Tuesday, however, Jigan Forte joined four other governors to express concern over NCAA President Charlie Baker and the Board of Governors. 
that the settlement is unduly burden small and medium-sized colleges athletic programs to benefit larger athletic programs. The thing about this revenue for student athletes has been a major issue as being student athletes, they are not entitled to the same benefits as the NCAA got by using their games to generate revenue uh, one way only. And it's also harder for big businesses to cut smaller bonuses and they tend to cut lower to the middle, middle uh, workers and earners to keep the status quo and the shareholders happy. It is a very disgusting system uh, where it benefits the top earners and if anyone complains, they sure they give them their rights and their things to the players, but the system itself is kind of uh, changed to benefit the people on top. So as I rant more about money practice, we'll get into the cost of housing as the Fed decided to cut interest rates uh, within the home. So that was the big news this week is they cut the interest rates. Long-term fixed r r rate mortgages are now at 6.2%, the lowest since February 2023. This means eff uh, effectively that the rate cut announced by the federal government may already be priced in through mortgage rates are bound uh, to fall in a little more than Policymakers have made it clear that they intend to continue cutting interest rates into the next year. So some good news going out into the weekend, and I hope you guys have a wonderful weekend. And for Wake Up Missoula, I'm Scott Ramph. I hope you guys have a wonderful weekend.